Okay, I want to say once again, hello everyone, and welcome to Classroom 2O Live. It is Saturday, March 24th, 2012, and our special guest is our featured teacher, Linda Yollis. And the topic for today is Featured Teacher. And I love that topic because when we have a very special guest as featured teacher, that means they can talk about anything they want to. And today we're in for a real treat because Linda is going to be sharing tons of awesome tips and suggestions and experiences about blogging with her students. So I will do a little introduction of Linda in a moment. I do want to let you know, as you can see, uh, Lorna Costantini and Kim Case, my fabulous co-hosts, are not here yet today. In fact, they're not going to be with us at all. So um, I am winging it. I'm usually behind the scenes and not on the mic. But today, Lori Moffat is helping us out with the co-facilitating, and as always, we have Tammy Moore in the room doing the closed captioning for us. So thanks to both of you for being here with us. And now I'm going to really move on to the next slide and let you know that all of our recordings are posted on our Classroom 2.0 Live Archives and Resources page. And <clears throat> We will keep the recording going to the end. So if for any reason you need to leave and we come back for a few more questions after the session is officially over, that will all be part of the recording. And we always love to start our sessions with the world map so we can find out where all of you are located. So if you will just take a moment to grab that little starburst just to the left of the world map, click on it, and place yourself on the map wherever you're located. Looks like we have both East and West Coast represented here, and I'm not seeing any starbursts yet from overseas, but it's possible you may be having trouble finding the place to put your starburst. If it doesn't go exactly where you like it, you can click and drag it and move it around. This is so awesome to see all of these starbursts popping up. And we're so glad to have you here. And look over there, we finally have that little Thailand uh, arrow showing up. So welcome to you. And one in the, uh, oh, sometimes they end up in the ocean. But you can, again, just click and drag that and move on. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. I do want to take just a moment to tell you that we do have a live binder for today's show, and as we do every week. And the live binder will include all of the links that Linda will be sharing with us, as well as any that you might share in the chat. So after the session is over, I go back in and add those links to the live binder. It makes it a really easy way for you to find all of the things that are talked about in the session. And you'll just click on the tab for Linda Yala's Featured Teacher, and you will find all of her links. We do a new live binder each month, so they don't get too big, but you can always go back and review any of them. And I'd also like to just point out one thing here that sometimes you don't discover. If you see where my hand is pointing up at the top, there's a tab for Classroom 2.0 Live Resources. If you click on that tab, you will see all of the things that directly relate to our show. So our home page, how to navigate the site, how to sign up for iTunes View, and there's also a link there for you to access the survey to request a professional development certificate. So if you ever watch a recording and want to um, request a certificate, just go to that tab and you can fill in the survey and I'll send it out to you. 
And now we'd like to start with just a couple of poll questions to give Linda a little bit of background about you, the special people in our audience. So if you have a class blog, we'd like you to click on that drop down menu that has a check mark by it, say yes or no. And those will start appearing in the participants list right by your name. It's right below your name, up at the top of the screen where the participants are listed. And you click on that drop down and then click on your choice. They're coming in great. Okay. So I'm going to bring up those responses so that we can all take a look at how it's looking right now. And it looks like about half of you, less than half of you, are not blogging with your class. And we have about 36% who are blogging with your class. So you are going to be thrilled with the suggestions you get from Linda today to learn more about how to get started and how to improve it if you're already blogging. Our next poll question, we'd like to know if you do blog in your classroom, do you get a lot of parent participation with your blog comments? And I'm going to ask you to start that again because I just cleared the results from the last post. So you can say none, obviously, if you don't have blog, um, classroom blog, or you can say yes or no. Great, those are coming in great. Some of you still may not have found the polling tool, but no worries. Um, you can also type in the chat, <laughs> as some of you are doing. I, I'm having trouble concentrating on the chat, but thank you for adding it wherever you can. And now I'll publish those results so we can all see them. And it's kind of as we anticipated. 29% of you are not getting a lot of participation from parents, and only 5% of you are. So you're going to be thrilled when you hear the tips that Linda has for you. All right. It is now time to do my official welcome to our featured teacher, Linda Yolas, today. And I want to tell you that Linda is with us today because she was nominated by McTeach, Karen McMillan, as someone she thought all of us should know about. And she was so right. <coughs> She said she first met Linda at the Google Geo Institute back in 2010. And this is where many of us discover uh, fabulous teachers by going to various workshops and webinars and virtual conferences. And Karen said it took her all of about two seconds to think, Wow, she's awesome. And she loved hearing her talk about getting the National Geographic giant traveling maps. And then she later watched the videos of how she used the maps with her students. And Karen said that when she first started developing her version of the paper blog activity, she studied how Linda introduced commenting to her students. And Karen said that her ideas really helped her feel confident that her own activity would work. And that's exactly how we learn from each other. It's recommendations like this that are so valuable because you are our eyes and ears for finding awesome teachers to share their experiences with all of us. So regardless of what grade level or subject you teach, you can be inspired. We can all be inspired and learn from all of them. And I'll tell you more about how you can nominate a featured teacher at the end of the show. But thanks, Karen, for your nomination of Linda. Well, Linda is a an elementary teacher. She's currently teaching third grade. She's been teaching elementary school for 25 years. She has her master's degree in integrating technology in the classroom, 
in the 21st century by exposing her third graders to technology. In 2011, her classroom blog won EduBlog's award for the best class blog, and we, many of us were there to cheer her and her students on in that award ceremony. In addition, she won uh, the award for the most influential post for her blog post called Learning How to Comment, and she's going to be sharing that with us today. Two weeks ago, Linda spoke at the Q Conference in Palm Springs, and she's going to be presenting with her Australian blogging colleague at ISTE in June. So if you're going to ISTE, you'll be sure want to check that out. And when Linda's not educating, which almost seems like it's 24-7, she enjoys adventure travel, hiking, biking, and spending time with her husband. So I wanted to say a huge welcome to Linda and to ask her to share with us in this newbie question, what does Web 2.0 mean to you? And why do you use Web 2.0 tools in your classroom? Welcome, Linda, and take over. Well, good morning. Can you give me a happy face if you can hear me? Plus, it'll just be nice to have a couple happy faces. Oh, good. Oh, good. Um, well, thank you for that introduction. Web 2.0 to me means creating and collaborating on the web. And blogging is a perfect example of what can be done in this interactive space. And today I'm going to show you how I use Web 2.0 tools to create an online learning community. So here we go. Um, as you can see, there I was up at Google with Karen, and there is a, my avatar picture from Google+. Plus. At the bottom is my name on Twitter. I hope if you're not using Twitter, you do, because it's a great place to meet people and to learn from one another. Also, if you, um, just so you know, I have a wiki called Educational Blogging, and it has a lot of the resources for teachers who are interested in classroom blogging, and it's going to be in the live binder. So. A little bit about my classroom, just so you can get a sense of, of what I have. I started blogging in 2008 with one laptop and a whole lot of enthusiasm. We really tried to leverage that one laptop as much as we could. We now have five. I have a digital camera that I use and I teach the children to use. It also has a video capability. We go to the computer lab every other week. And most students uh, have access to a computer at home, which is wonderful. What surprises some people is that the blog is not graded and participation is usually optional. And what I've found is kids are so interested in this online learning space that they come in after school on their weekends and write. So it's a real um, incredible space for kids. I also have one set of AlphaSmart computers, which I wrote a grant for, and they're not, they can't go on, online, but I use them to teach computer typing skills, which I think is a real important skill in today's world. We also teach cursive, but typing is important. I teach, I, the foundation of our blog is language arts, and today I'm going to be talking about how I teach and practice quality writing. I'm also going to show you some ways that I integrate curriculum in the blog post and in the comments, and how I try to make it interactive. And this is a biggie for blogging, is that the kids have an audience for their writing. If you look at this cluster map, you can see that there is an audience, and it's not only their own parents, but it's other teachers around the world, uh, it's other classes around the world, and the students want to rise up and produce good work so that they continue to have readers. I love blogging because it also builds community. I mean, you look at this picture from my classroom, and there they are paired up writing together. Oftentimes they're commenting back to one another. Um, it's a great place also to practice technology skills and learn about the all-important Internet safety. In my classroom there is a constant discussion going on about Internet safety. 
you know, about limiting personal information, how you present yourself, creating that digital footprint. It's not just a unit you cover in one week. It also raises global understanding and interest because kids want to know where their readers are from, so they get out the map, they go to the globe. So it also is a great place I've discovered for differentiation. And I'm going to show you some samples of some writing from the blog, some screenshots that I've taken that can illustrate it. So here's a screenshot of my class blog. I started it with Blogger, as I said, in 2008. And I, since I started with Blogger, I've stayed with it. But I, I can tell you EduBlogs is a great platform, too, and you get a lot of technical support with it. If you are choosing to go with uh, Blogger, I do recommend that you take the time to remove the navigation bar at the top. And there's directions on the wiki. Sometimes the next blog is not an appropriate blog at all. So. That's, um, that's what I recommend. I teach all of my lessons about vlogging around right from our classroom blog. However, I also started a 365 or 366 project last year, and it has proven to be a great place for students to contribute their own photographs that they take to write creative stories. For example, in this photo, it shows, you know, I was packing up my Christmas decorations to put them in the attic. And what happened in the comments section is the kids started writing comments as if there were the decorations in the box and they were telling me about what they were doing in the attic. They were having parties with the Halloween decorations. So it's a really, it's an, a funny that it's become a really um, interesting place for creative writing and expression. I've even had other teachers submit photos. So I, I love that. I start blogging on day one, at least the last two years I have. I feel like you'll never have everyone's attention like you do on that first day. So the minute I get my student list, I send an email out to all the parents with a link to this welcome video post that I made on YouTube. In that post, there's a how to comment tutorial because I have found that most parents are not that familiar with blogging. and it is a great way to introduce them. And it also, to me, illustrates that the blog is going to be an important space for our learning. And I have found that you really need to teach directed lessons about commenting. Otherwise, you get a lot of comments like, you know, this rocks with a thousand exclamation marks. And, you know, writing that is not really of the standard I want to practice in third grade. So I bring them together on the rug, and we talk about what makes for a good comment. So you can see this picture was from a brainstorming. And you can see the kids said, well, you need to capitalize sentences and proper nouns. You need to punctuate, spelling is important, try to use high level vocabulary. Sometimes the topic sentence and conclusion is relevant. But I also introduced to them that content is really important, that when you add your comment, you know, give a specific compliment to the writer, ask, ask relevant questions. So we talk about content as well. But together as a class, we come up with the standard that we're going to accept for writing. And we work toward that standard. And I should mention to everybody that I moderate everything that is published on the blog. So there's nothing that gets published without my permission. And sometimes kids post if they haven't had their, I'm sorry, their comments don't get published because they have too many spelling errors and they are supposed to have parent supervision. So. Uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit after about a video that we made, and we're going to run this web tour and show it in a second. Last year we took our knowledge and we created a video to help us and others master the skill of commenting. And I find that kids really get a lot out of creating videos, teaching each other. And I also want you to watch for the presentational skills that the kids have learned in this video. Uh, that's an element that we need to be teaching too. So let's go ahead and we can do that web tour and I'll see you at the end. Hi, it's Mrs. Yolis from California. Panda and I are here to talk about commenting. You know, the comment section is my favorite part of the blog. That's where people can respond to what you've written. You can write back to them. You can get some great conversations going in the comment section. So 
Let's talk about what makes for a good comment. My students have some excellent tips for you. I like your shirt. Thank you. You're welcome. We're, We're talking, talking about complimenting. complimenting. Whenever you leave a comment, it's always nice to open with a specific compliment. If you like the bloggers writing, tell them. If the blogger you to navigate, compliment them. Be positive and be specific. It's always good to add factual information to your comment. For example, if someone is writing about the Statue of Liberty and you've seen it or read about the Statue of Liberty, go ahead and write some new factual information. How old is it? How tall is it? Be sure to look at the comment section to make sure no one has written what you want to say. And if no one has, go ahead and write it. Have fun adding factual information to your comment. To make a comment better, it is nice to have a connection with the writer. Connections remind people of things. For example, let's say your friend published a post about their camping trip and it reminded you of hiking at Big Bear. Then you might want to share some facts about your trip. That is how you make connections with the writer. It's always a good thing to ask relevant questions at the end of your comments. Try to get a conversation going. Exactly. For example, if someone posts something about ladybugs and you are wondering something about their lifespan or the colors that they come in, then you should ask. Hopefully the blogger, the blogger will respond to you. For example, another example is that Miss McGeady and I got a little conversation going in, in one of the posts called Fabulous Fall. Um, we talked about the trees, and I asked her how many, how many trees she has in her backyard. She responded, and I'm really happy I got the answer. Um, it's always a good thing to get a little conversation going at the end. If you get a conversation going, then drop by and leave us a comment. We'd love to hear about it and learn about it. See you later. Bye. The last step for leaving quality comments is to proofread. Panda here is going to teach us some tips about proofreading. What's that, Panda? Yeah, I will. Panda says that always at the beginning of your sentence, you use capital letters. And at the end, you use punctuation. What else, Panda? Sure. Always use only one exclamation mark. And if you want to really show your excitement, use more words, not more exclamation marks. Finally, he says if you use the pronoun I, always capitalize it. Panda and I wish you happy blogging. Wow, those were some great tips. Thanks, Panda. So, now that we know how to write a great comment, let's get out there and leave some quality comments for our blogger friends. Good luck, everybody. So that's a video that they wrote, that they prepared, and they put together, and you can see they're passionate about it, they're interested, and it really helps elevate the level of the comments. And anyone can use that video. The only thing I ask is that you just link back to our blog so we can see um, who's using it. It's fun to see. The other thing, the next step for me with teaching commenting skills is reading and evaluating comments. So as you can see in this picture, 
I have the comment up on the projector in the back and someone's going to read the comment and the students are giving it a point value. This is a, an idea I got from Sue Waters. They read it and they discuss and give it a one point or a two point. And then we talk. So someone who said this is a one point, they'll say, well, you know, all the sentences start the same or they really didn't add anything new to the discussion. Or we'll look at a different comment and someone will give it a two and they'll say, well, this person has high level vocabulary. They added relevant information. It's a two. And this type of daily uh, discussion is rich and meaningful. We don't do it all year long, but at the beginning of the year, it's really helpful. Another idea that I got from one of my many blogging buddies from Kelly Jordan and Kathleen Morris in, in Australia, they made a poster that they have and they've published, they have it hanging on the wall behind their blogging center and I think that's a great idea. I am always looking for ways to incorporate parents and family into our blog and I really am going to show you some ways that I try to encourage their participation because they are key. Uh, for one, I have a subscribe by email button in the sidebar. Here's a screenshot of it. And I also have an RSS feed if people know about that. And I always include a video about how to leave a comment because most of them, like I said, are not that familiar with blogging. They know about Facebooking and they know about texting, but blogging is still pretty new to them. So. Although I mentioned to them that I would like them to participate in the class blog when I talked to them at back to school night, it didn't really seem to happen. So I created Family Blogging Month with a big invitation to participate. We dedicate the month of November as Family Blogging Month. It's a good one because in the United States you've got Thanksgiving so everybody's off for a week so there's a real opening there. But what we do is each child gets a piece of paper and they write down, you know, mom, dad, sister, brother, uncle, any relatives they'd like to invite. And then they pick a post that they think that family member would like. Maybe a post, a math post for mom or an animal post for a brother. And they can choose any post from our archive, which goes back to 2008. And then we keep track of family members who comment in, during that month. And you can do anything you like with the results. We have top winners. The top three win a free open post on Mrs. Yolis' classroom blog, which they really like. Oh, and you can also do, if you don't want to have a competition, you can set a class goal, which um, I know people like to do. I know Melody's done that. The family blogging has branched out into that important demographic which I want to alert everyone to and that is the grandparents. Whenever I publish a post, I usually send out a quick email to the parents and in that email I encourage them to forward the, the link to a grandparent. And last year I had a grandfather living in Italy. He contacted me and offered to write about his, his uh, life in different cities in Italy and so I gave him writer's permission and he became a regular guest blogger in our Where's Nono series. In this picture, we were reading The Mysterious Giant of Barletta. Nono went to Barletta and did a post about it. So really tap into those grandparents. I also include parents with student blogs. I know a lot of people have student blogs and it's really up to the teacher how they want to go about passing those out or including them. Students who are active in our class blog and they demonstrate good work habits, can earn a blog in my class. I hold a parent education meeting, and the parents then go home and set up the blog, and they become the administrator of their child's blog. They're learning right along with their child, which I think is really important for them to stay current, and the child can continue blogging after they've left their class, my class. And it also opens up more blogging opportunities for the students in my class. So I'm going to switch gears now and go through some of the ways that I integrate curriculum into the blog. And I'm going to share how I look for opportunities to make our blog, either the post or the comment sections, interactive and interesting. Um, I'm going to show you some screenshots that I took to give you some sample ideas. I do have a lot of examples, so I'm going to go through them quickly. Uh, this is one that I did about compound sentences. It has, as you can see, number one and two, it's the definition of what a compound sentence is. Below the, the Olympic flag, there's the beginning of some student-generated 
compound sentences that we wrote. And I usually wrap these kinds of language lessons around a current event like this one was around the Olympics. And so the comment section ends up being filled with information about that current event. This one had comments about the medal count, about the games. So it's a great way to teach a specific lesson that you want to see in writing. It's there for parents or students, and it gives you a chance to talk about some current events. Halloween is a great place. It's a great opportunity for kids to write creatively and learn how to create an interesting image without revealing too much information. So you can see this girl, she set up a pose, she's got the pumpkin, it really tells a story without revealing who she is and she's not just standing there in her costume. So teaching that kind of digital uh, creativity is great and you can see her high level vocabulary has been bolded. We do a story about traditions in our reading book and in this post students and parents are invited to share in the comment section about a family tradition. So if you look at the green, I'm offering up that it can be an annual party, it can be a holiday, or it can be a traditional event. And in blue it says, please include details about special foods, decorations, songs, and or activities just so parents can help their child work on um, the writing and writing those detailed sentences and it says be sure a parent proofread because it's important to have the parents right there especially in third grade. Sometimes I kickstart the comment section with a comment I wrote myself and this is a screenshot of one I wrote. I model quality writing like showing detailed sentences and then we all get to learn about each other. I also demonstrate that I think it's important for everybody to participate and that your teacher is a writer too. So, you know, I've got your class. Um, our one family vacation I thoroughly enjoyed was one that I was growing, when I was growing up was our annual trip to Pelican Lake, Minnesota. When school got out in June, my mother would pile my two siblings into our 1968 Chevy Bel Air wagon and we endured the long, so you can see I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm modeling for them. Here's another post that I've got a screenshot from. Um, in this one was we read the great kapok tree and then each student selected a rainforest animal from that book and we used the world book online to research and take notes. And then, which was, it was very fun, uh, the kids pretended like they were that animal in the comment section and taught us about it. So again, I kickstarted it with one that we wrote in class. So we came up to the rug and we picked the boa constrictor and we wrote this together. You can see some of it's bold because I taught them how to use HTML so that the facts are in bold and then the fantasy parts are not. It's a great way to get them to write without copying and pasting. And you can see I'm just going to read a little bit of it during Mrs. Yolis' class. I am a boa constrictor who lives in Brazil. I'm just lazing around here because I recently devoured a guinea pig. Now I am inactive, so I have time to comment on your blog. So you can see there's voice, but there's also, also factual information. Here's a sample of a typical third grader. So it says, Dear Mrs. Yolis, I am pink and swim in the Amazon River. I have a hump on my back instead of a dorsal fin. I just ate fish for dinner. Did you know when I was born I was gray and then white? And now that I'm older, I'm pink. So that's, that's very typical of a third grader. But here's where the differentiation comes in. Here is one from a gifted student. You can see it opens with onomatopoeia. You can see She's bolded with HTML. You can, there's a clear voice here. I'm just going to read the beginning part. Squawk, squawk, excuse me, allow me to introduce myself. I am Tilly the Talented Toucan. And there she's using alliteration. My toucan buddies and I live in, and she's got her facts here. It's just a great opportunity for a full range of writing. And then everyone gets a chance to read it. And they had a ball reading these, and you'd have one predator writing back to another. So it, it was just wonderful. It was such a success, I did it with the biographies. Okay, so later that year we did a biography. And this biography used to be a book report that I would do, and we still do something similar, but I turned it in to a commenting project. So students left comments as if they were that famous person, and it says in red, family members and friends, you are invited to choose your own biography subject and join in the conversation. And 
again, here is a student sample. This is a typical third grade. Dear Mrs. Jones, I'm Amelia Earhart. I was born. You could see a lot of the sentences start the same way, but in the second paragraph, I love to fly airplanes. In fact, nice transition. It's a great third grade sample. Here is a gifted student. And in the comment section, here's Leonardo da Vinci. Although I lived in the 1400s, it's my pleasure to visit your wonderful, magnificent blog in the 21st century. So, you know, she's really taken it to another level. And if you look in the comments section, it was fantastic. You'd have Thomas Edison, I believe that was Mr. Avery, talking to Leonardo da Vinci. You had Elizabeth Blackwell conversing with Sally Ride. So a lot of kids were only required to leave one comment, but they came back and continued participating because it was so much fun. Here's a couple math examples that I have. We did a wonderful um, math post where we were learning these new types of math problems that were new. So it would be questions like this. Panda and Hoppy have 125 comments. Panda has 25 more than Hoppy. How many comments did Hoppy have? How many did Panda have? And students went home and wrote their own, submitted them, to the comment section. So the next day, we were able to use student-generated word problems. And the pride on their faces, it was just amazing. So here's one sample. Dear Mrs. Jones' class, the Statue of Liberty in Mount Rushmore had 728 visitors in total. The Statue of Liberty has 124 more visitors. How many visitors? And you can see. I also want you to take note that here's a kid who is experimenting with HTML. I taught him a couple of codes with different patterns and numbers, and he's been experimenting with those and making his posts his own. This one, actually, I don't have a picture of it, but I tweeted out a challenge to some other teachers to create their own, and they created their word problems using their state symbols. I know Ellie, who's in here, participated. This is Tripp from South Carolina. So that was a fun way to integrate math and social media and learn about the other states. The comment, the um, gadget, the visitor count, provides a lot of opportunities for lessons. Every, about a couple times during the week, we write the number that we have in standard form, expanded form, and word form. And then occasionally, you get a fun number, like this was a palindrome. So in the comments section, people started contributing their own palindrome in the comments section. So it was just a little thing that happened that became a fun post, a fun learning opportunity. We've used a lot of digital photography to demonstrate learning. So we went out and looked around the campus, and kids took turns taking pictures of arrays they saw and then wrote a sentence complimenting it. Talk about Web 2.0 tools. Here we went on Google Earth, which we do a lot. And we explored Washington, D.C., which we read about in our social studies book. But while we were in there exploring Washington, D.C., we looked for geometric features that we also learned in our geometry lesson. So I try and blend as many subjects as I can when we go online. And then this came, became a blog post as well. I love a tool called PhotoPage. It is a great one for creating slideshows and embedding them in your blog. But it also has a great feature that's called an interactive quiz. And these are two screenshots that I made from one called, is it a circle, is it a sphere? Because that kids sometimes have trouble in third grade figuring out the difference. So this is on, the, on our blog open for kids to play at home and practice those skills. I also did one for social studies because we're learning about the three branches of government. So I was able to use photos. And they have a little quiz so they can study at home. I'm not going to talk a lot about Skype. There's some links in there that I'm going to share with you. Um, but it is a terrific way to connect with blogging buddies, with experts like Paula. We connected with her, and she shared about Mardi Gras. Um, a big thing we do is rather than just reading about communities, which is a big part of third grade social studies, we Skype with them. We Skype with Brooklyn, New York, where there you know, was an urban center. And then we Skyped with our blogging buddies, Mrs. McKenzie in New Zealand. They only had 900 people in their community. So it's a great way 
to bring learning to life and kids learn about time zones, about the hemispheres. It's very meaningful. We get out traditional atlases when we do this and we use Google Earth. And I'm not going to talk a lot about this mystery Skype call. I learned about it through languages and she's a great one to follow on Twitter if you don't already. And she introduced the idea uh, of a mystery Skype where students make a phone call to each other on Skype but they don't know where they live so they have to figure it out asking yes and no questions. I'm adding a link for more information about uh, giving student jobs during Skype calls that is really important and I know Mr. Avery, I don't know if he's in here but he also set up a great wiki so you can connect and set up a mystery Skype call if you'd like. I have connected with a lot of people through commenting and what I mean by that is I would look at a lot of people's blogs and I would try to find people that were similar to my students and try to um, connect with them and I would leave comments oftentimes they would comment back to me and a relationship would develop. And I'm going to share one project that came out of that. But one thing I recommend to you is this idea they call quad blogging. And if you, I'm going to put a link in there, there it is for quad blogging. If you go to that site, Deputy Mitchell, who created it, will set you up with three other blogs. You can also just Google <coughs> quad blogging and you can enter your class and be paired up and each week you get a chance to have your blogging buddies come to your blog and it really is a nice way to develop some relationships that you might want to do other projects with but I, I really recommend that. And this is the result of some of the connections I made just through commenting. This is called the Our World, Our Stories project. And this was a project we did this year over the course of a month. And you can see from the flags, it involved classes from Australia, from Belize, from Canada, from Ghana, from New Zealand, and from the United States. And it was a great space for us to share traditional stories, music, um, games, this game bamboo that we ended up sharing became very popular with our blogging buddies. Um, and this just came out of the friendships that, that we have developed through reciprocal commenting. And blogging can be as creative as you like. <laughs> For example, I met Jonas Salsic through blogging through leaving comments on each other's blogs and we've known each other for a couple of years although we've never met. Um, we decided that we love our, our individual blogs but that we wanted to find a way to complement the literacy themes that we were trying to have during our reading session and so we set up this reading roundup uh, post and we make green screen movies. We have Skype book clubs and the students who comment the most get to be deputy sheriffs. So you've got Deputy Bob signing or Deputy Carol. You know, the kids really respond to that kind of motivation and you get a lot of quality writing. I'm not going to share the video right now, but you, it's in the, uh, the video that we most recently made was about text features. So check out that. So my final slide before I open it up for questions if anybody has any, these are some tips that I recommend um, if you're starting a blog or if you are, um, you have a blog but you're having problems. I partner, I, I started out by myself but I partner with um, Faith Ranny at my school. She started blogging last year and it really helps to have someone who is there to help you troubleshoot, to motivate you to to work with. A lot of times we share the responsibility like she'll make a post and I'll just copy and paste it on mine. Another idea is to set some reasonable goals for yourself and just start. When I started my goal was to publish one post a week and that was my goal. And I with experience I have become more confident and I, I now manage a couple of blogs and some student blogs but start small, set a reasonable goal but just begin. I reuse successful posts, you know, like the um, one on the K-pop tree we're going to be doing again this year, the one on the biographies we're going to be doing again because 
it worked. And so I just copy and paste, put that in, and then the comments become new. So to, to be efficient with your time, don't be afraid to use, reuse those successful posts. As I said at the beginning, definitely join Twitter. It's a great place to connect with people, to learn, to get support. William Chamberlain, if you don't follow him, you should. He invented this hashtag on Twitter, Comments for Kids, and it's been a tremendous resource for generating comments for my students. Whenever we post, I always put a tweet out, and my student bloggers now come to me and ask me to tweet out their new posts, and they want that comment for kids because that's how they expand their audience. And the last tip I have is look for ways to adapt what you traditionally do. A lot of teachers say to me, um, you know, Linda, I really just don't have time to take on blogging. It's just too much. And, and what it took me a while to realize and what I say to them is it's not that you're taking on more. You're actually adapting what you're doing and what you want to do for the online space, like book reports that you used to do. Turn them around, make them a blog post, make it more interactive, make it more accessible. Um, look for ways, opportunities to just share interesting posts that you want the kids to learn because once you create the post, the learning can continue, kids can come back. So it's not that you're adding more, it's that you are adapting, you're changing, and you will start to see, as I have, um, that I've really turned my classroom around and it is really a global learning community that involves students, teachers, friends, all over the world and it's, it's just incredible. So with that, I'll wrap it up and I, I sure appreciate everybody coming today. You know, the blogging community is a really uh, supportive group of people and um, tap into it. So, all right. Thank you very much, and, and uh, Lauren, I guess we'll see if anybody has any questions. Thank you so much, Linda. That was just so motivating and such great tips. It doesn't matter what grade level you teach, all the way up through teaching pre-service teachers, certainly with adults in all levels and all subjects. It, I, I can't wait to go back and listen to it again. I'd like to ask Lori if she happened to catch any questions coming through the chat that she could take the mic and share with you. Yes, I did, Peggy and Linda. Um, one, the first question Peggy actually answered in the chat directly, and that was what school you were in, Linda. Um, so I've checked that one off. The next one wasn't until a while after that, uh, and it was from Julie Hembry. Does anyone have an HTML document they could share with me? Um, that is one that has the HTML code. So that was that was a question. And I think <laughs> Thanks for asking that question. I did put in the links. There's a if you go to my blog at the top of the page, you know, there's a home and there's a meet Mrs. Yolis, meet the bloggers. But there's also a link there for teaching HTML. And at first, I wasn't really sure that my third graders can handle it, but I am amazed. They love emphasizing words in their comment by bolding, by um, using italics, and many of them hyperlink, which I love. You know, in their comment, they're mm -hmm. talking about something, and then they hyperlink. So mm -hmm. there, there's a link to that. So that's, thanks, Julie. That's great. That's terrific. Uh, there was a question about photo peach, and I'm from Sarah. I'm not, I probably would like the clarification on your question. It's. Originally, it sounded like, uh, do you have to pay for that feature? Is Was that for the in-slide quiz feature you were asking about for Photo Peach? Because later on, somebody Photo typed Peach that, is, that Photo Peach itself was free. That's right. Photo Peach is free. You can mm -hmm. pay, I think it's $30 a year, and you get a couple of extra features. but. 
which I do now, but I got by easily with the free site. And you can, it's a nice way because you can quickly upload photos and add to them. I often have the kids write the comments that match the photos. And then there is an interactive piece if you want it. So it's, it's great, it's easy to use, and it is easily embedded in the blog. That's terrific. Um, a question came up. Does Linda have an aide to assist her? I guess considering all the, all what seems like extra activities, but you've said that you've incorporated blogging into your teaching. I wish I had an aide in my class. <laughs> no, I don't. You know what? I really have learned as my confidence has, you know, I've gained confidence as a blogger. I've learned that you can maximize the time in your room and, and kids really want to comment. So in the morning we, we do have a dedicated blogging time of anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes in the morning, but then I do have rotations with those laptops where the kids can go and write a comment, they can pair up or individually as they finish their work. See, so if you have free time mm -hmm. and you want to comment, you can go. Mm -hmm. And I always like to proofread, so our signal in our class, if you're done, is to just put two hands up. And if I don't have time and someone else would like to, to get in there, I've taught them how to open up a tab. Mm -hmm. So you can have multiple tabs queuing up waiting for me to proofread. And, um, and if there's problems with the proofreading, I don't necessarily correct them. I make them go back in and fix them so that the writing is always... Uh, that last step of proofreading and making sure what you're saying uh, makes sense and that you're contributing. Sure. Um, as I'm capturing yet another question and trying to to copy it, another question was, what's the biggest obstacle for teachers to get started with blogging? Um, it's a, at first, if you're not that familiar with any of the platforms, it can be a lot of time as you learn and as you set up your blog and, and learn about the voice that you want to have on your blog with your students. But it gets better. You know, I started kind of on my own, so I was learning on my own and it was a lot of time. I really recommend pairing up with people because I said you can share responsibility, you can troubleshoot. And a lot, I've also been asked, you know, how much time. At the beginning, mm -hmm. I devoted a lot of time. Now, I'm pretty proficient at blogging. It doesn't take me as long to put together a post. And the comments that I moderate really depends on the activity that week. Sometimes there are no comments. So there's nothing to do. Mm -hmm. Other times, you know, like during our quad blogging week, there's a lot to do. Sure. So, um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, how do you integrate the student with vision challenges or other disabilities in the blogging or in the classroom? Was another question. I've that never had. Chat. Yeah, yeah. I have never had anybody visually mm -hmm. impaired, so I, I don't have an answer for that. But I have a full range of kids in the room, from um, gifted kids, mm -hmm. special ed kids, variety, and. You know, we do a lot of pairing up, as you saw with them sitting at the computer, and mm -hmm. there's a lot of cooperation and support within our classroom and, as I said, with the parents. The parents are really helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, Dragon Dictate is also a good program for um, challenged people. Um, that's been out for a number of years and has probably been, been uh, updated quite often. Um, Karen asked, where do the kids type the HTML code? In the comment section in Word and then cut and paste? Where do they actually put in the code once they have it? I, once they learn to type, we have been using our laptops and we have been drafting comments in Word which they really like because they turn on the readability statistic and they can mm -hmm. get the reading the writing level that they're on. So they love right. that. But they do they do include the code when they I know for blogger, they can copy and paste it right in the comment section, but the coding is right there in, in the comment section. I don't think that's true for Edublog. Maybe somebody who ha who has an Edublog account could comment about that.
another question that came up in the chat itself. Uh, do you do you do it during the lesson, or do you post them on the blog and then students have a look and respond it, to them at home? As far as commenting, I think. Right at the beginning of the year, we do a lot of group conversation, comment writing. You know, anybody who contributes a sentence gets to sign their name, and we do that greeting and closing just because it's a third grade standard, and it mm -hmm. does help with young children for the flow. Mm -hmm. But anybody who helped at the beginning gets to sign their name. And then, as I said, we do dedicate a block in the morning, so I have rotations of kids mm -hmm. going in and blogging either individually or in pairs. When we go to the computer lab every other week, they, they individually write or some kids like to pair. And a lot of kids write from home. It is not uncommon mm -hmm. at all for a Saturday morning, and here's a well-drafted, relevant comment several of them coming in on the weekends and after school. So that just mm -hmm. really, to me, illustrates how interested kids are in writing and mm -hmm. connecting. So I love that. But there's, it's both. And if kids don't have, I have had a situation where kids didn't have access to the computer and wanted to write a comment or they had technical errors, they can just um, write it out old school on paper and bring it the next day and then type it in or I can type it in for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, we also do have two hands that are raised. and. Louise, go ahead and ask your question. I think you have the mic. If you turn on the talk button, you should be able to ask. There you go. I'll go Louise off Morgan. Can you work like this? And we started blogging at school. So kids. The space is getting used up very quickly. And so by the end of the school year, um, I'm thinking that we'll probably end up not using that blog again, and next year I'll set up something different. This is my first year to do it, so I have a, a kind of a learning curve going on. But I want my students to be able to access their blogs, maybe even next year or whatever. And I was just wondering how do you um, how do you handle that for your students who leave you? Do they still have access to the blog and that kind of thing? Thanks, Louise. You know, when I, I am in Blogger, I don't know, I can't speak for what happens with, um, there we go, but you can't, uh, I, I don't know about EduBlog, but with Blogger, I started in 2008, I'm still using the same blog. I haven't run out of space yet. I don't know what I'll do when that happens, but I started that, and at the end of the year, I wondered, well, should I keep it? Should I start a new one? And I just decided, well, just leave it, let it go. I left it, and what happened was uh, the kids, my new students, had access to these fabulous comments that my students wrote at the end of the year. So it ended up being a great model for my students in terms of what a good comment looks like. Plus, they knew the kids. These kids were now in fourth grade. So I ended up leaving the blog, and now all the years that I've blogged since 2008 are there in the archive. I like that. I don't know what other people do with their blogs, but I also know I've had students come back and go to their posts and, and read about them. So I keep it, and I haven't run out of space yet. Okay, Karen, you have the mic now. You may ask your question. Oh, yeah, my question already. Thank you. Then go ahead, Paula. Sounds like Karen already asked her question. You now have the mic. Everyone, good afternoon. Hi, Linda. It was great. I enjoyed the show. And I have learned so much from you about blogging in my classroom with my students. Um, I was wondering if you have shared any of the links to your students' um, blogs, the ones that have earned. Uh, the blogs uh, through your classroom activities, 
I know I have uh, followed a couple of them, and they are awesome. And I, I wasn't sure if they had been included in <clears throat> the live binder links or if you want to drop some of the links in the chat room. I think some of the participants would love to see what your student, your, your, your current students and former students have done with theirs. Thank you. Thanks, Paula. <laughs> I appreciate that. You know, I think I did put that in. If not, I, I can. I launched six last, uh, I think in December or January, there's six of them. And the year before, you know, it depends on the parent interest beyond my classroom. I have, I think, three, maybe four kids from the prior year who have continued with their parents and are continuing to blog. But, you know, if you're if they head into a classroom where no one's blogging, it kind of loses, you know, the momentum. But I do have some fourth graders that are still blogging and my current bloggers are there. And I'm about to launch another round of them and we've had a lot of discussions in class about what uh, what are the pros and cons of having your own blog? And the kids who have them have discussed that, you know, it's a lot of fun. You get to connect with people like Paula and have readers and share, but it also is a lot of responsibility because you need to be polite and comment back to those people. So I have about four kids who are interested and their parents have agreed to do it, and so I'll be launching those. But the kids who come to me and say they'd like to, I really uh, talk pretty frankly to them and, and say, you know, I'd love to give you a blog, but we need to see a little more participation in the class blog because if you have your own, it's going to be a lot more responsibility. You really have to demonstrate a true interest right now. So let's practice that commenting and participating with the blogs we have. And that usually is very, very motivating. Okay, Peggy, go ahead and close the show. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Lori. And I want to officially do a quick wrap-up on our show because we do try to end on an hour, but as many of you know, there are often lots of questions that continue after that. So we'll wrap up the show, keep the recording going, and then if any of you would like to take the mic and continue to ask your questions, as long as Linda's willing to stay and answer them, that will be wonderful. We do like to let you know that Steve Hargadon does some incredible interviews with some really fantastic people. Many of them are book authors, but many of them are just educational leaders. And coming up this Tuesday, um, we have Alec Kuros talking about social learning. On Thursday, Dick Gale is talking about appreciative inquiry and positive deviance. That should be fascinating. April 4th, Howard Rheingold, who does some incredible things, is going to talk about NetSmart and how to thrive online. And on April 5th, Joseph Grenny will be talking about change. All of those are conducted as interviews and conversations, not presentations, but they are fascinating. Also want to invite you back to any of our upcoming shows that you can make. On March 31st, we have an awesome presenter, Latia Cooper, is going to be doing her presentation on 100 plus STEM resources, and she does it all through a live binder. Also want to let you know, no show April 7th, that's Easter weekend, but on April 14th, we have another fabulous featured teacher coming up, and that is Elaine Plyben. And on April 21st, we're doing something, it's not us, but we're participating in a very exciting day. It is the then virtual conference, but now combined for that one day with Classroom 2.0, and they're calling it the Social Learning Summit. Any of you can submit presentations for that conference day, and they're all being posted. Everything is being accepted, and then they're going to select the best, I think, 
that have been submitted to feature on that day. So you have through April 7th to submit your proposal, and then all of us are going to participate in the sessions. They'll all be 30 minutes long, and all are focusing on practical classroom application, or could be pedagogy and uh, ways you think about teaching the things that you do. So we won't have a show that day because we all want to participate in that. Also, there's a great new uh, webinar coming up with Live Binders. They do a monthly webinar called the Knowledge Sharing Place, and they not only talk about what you can do with Live Binders, but they feature some really great Live Binders by the people who created them. So the next session on Wednesday, March 28th, is all about the Common Core. So for those of you in the United States, that's a word that is becoming very familiar to you. And we all love the opportunity to learn more about that. So you can join Mike Fisher and Toby Price on Wednesday, March 28th. And you can go to our Classroom 20 Live calendar, and you'll see all of these events posted there. We do want you to think about nominating a featured teacher. It is so great when you can tell us about somebody you know or even about yourself. And please don't be shy about nominating yourself. If you know that you're doing some wonderful things with technology with your students, we would love to hear from you. And so we accept those nominations in this form that is in our live binder. And it is a tiny URL that will, um, just, it's just a little Google form that you can fill in and tell us about the teacher you want to nominate. And um, as, as you know, we do one a month. So it may take us a while to get to it, but we really uh, will be getting to all of them at one point or another, so let us know who you think would be a great teacher, any grade level, any age level, all the way up through adult. And we also like to let you know that you can always get a PD certificate for participating in these sessions, and you can get them for the live sessions or you can get them for the um, recordings. You can go to this link directly. It should also pop up when you leave the room. And But if it doesn't, you, I will open that link in your browser. You will also find it under the Classroom 2.0 Live resources on our Live Binder. So remember, go to that Classroom 2.0 tab. Um, and you'll be able to get that survey no matter when you view the video recording. I will provide you a professional development certificate if you fill in that survey and give me your name and email address. Please double check your email address because from time to time they come through as undeliverable because you may have reversed a letter or left a letter out. But if, if you submit it on the form, it's usually later the same day or the next day that I get those certificates out. It's not automatic, but I take all of your emails from the survey results and send, create the certificate and send it out to you. Also, remember that you can get the subscription to all of our uh, presentations, either video or audio, on iTunes U. And I find that's just a great way to be able to watch the presentations away from my computer. So I subscribe to the video collection on iTunes U, and those are always posted within a couple days after the session. I do want to say a really special thank you to Linda for sharing her great resources with us today. Not only the resources, but her motivation, her, her passion for blogging. It has been outstanding. I also want to say thank you to Steve Hargadon, who is the founder of Classroom 2.0 and many other educational projects, including the Web 2.0 Labs project. And we do want to thank both Weebly and Blackboard Collaborate for providing our website and for this platform for hosting our shows. So now I'm going to um, see if Karen, you had your hand up a bit ago, but I would love for you to take the mic just momentarily and share something about your blogging experience. 
I'll give you the mic if you'll take it. Yes, Mickey, it's you. I included your links for paper blogging in the live binder, so it's possible that you might want to comment on that. Go ahead. Hi, um, you, you hear me all right? Hearing you great, thanks. Okay. Um, first of all, Linda, fantastic, fantastic show. Thank you so much. Um, I. I've already got some ideas to start on Monday and I'm actually going to be having my seventh graders work with the third graders on a project um, that is yet to be determined, but now I have some great ideas, so thank you for that. Um, as far as uh, paper blogging goes, um, that's been a fantastic experience for me as well as for my kids um, and a great way to introduce um, blogging and how the blogging process works, but um, I couldn't have gotten started without Linda's um, fabulous ideas and on how she teaches her kids to comment. Um, and I love that video. I hadn't seen that before of your kids explaining how the process um, of commenting works. I am so going to use that with my kids. Uh, I was thinking originally I'd show it to them next year when we start, but um, I think it's a great review for my current kids. But um, yeah, fantastic show. Uh, if, I don't know if anybody has questions for me, but um, that's about all I have to say. Thanks, Peggy. Thanks a lot. I know that earlier we had some hands up that took them down, and so I'm not sure if you had to leave or if you still have comments. We would love to have you take the mic. Uh, Bill, you had your hand up, but maybe you had to leave. Um, looks like it. Uh, anyone else want to raise your hand to take the mic to ask a question or share a comment? Wonderful, Reba. Let me give you the mic, and you can go ahead. Click on talk. Okay, can you hear me okay? A little bit louder. Oh, okay. Let me turn. Much it. better. Okay. I do want to thank Linda for the blog. I mean, I've learned so many new things um, that I'm going to also try to use with the teachers. And I want to tell Miss um, tell Miss Teach that I used her paper blogging with teachers when I tried to get them to start blogging because a lot of teachers didn't have the con concept of the blogging and the commenting and a lot of them have never ever used it. But I want to thank both of you guys and I'm going to take it back and work with them. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Reba. And Sarah just asked a question in the chat that I would love to have her take the mic and expand on. And she's asking about commenting versus writing. And she says she's scared this, her, that hers will be too echoey. Can you take the mic, Sarah? I'm afraid that my mic might be too echoey. There you go. Yes, yeah, I got it. Um, my voice, um, I didn't realize it was echoing when I spoke. I thought I had such a great computer. Anyway, um, I was wondering about, I have a K-1 class, and my concern is that they see themselves as writers, and they are writers, and that's sort of the purpose for my blogs. And your um, discussion today, uh, Linda, has made me really think about commenting versus um, the actual blog posting and sort of, I guess it sort of just depends on what your purposes is, purposes are, but I am really interested in your opinion about um, just when you start kids off, I know your kids earn their blogs, uh, just sort of what your thoughts are on those comment, having kids blogging versus the um, just the commenting. Um, you know, when I first started out, I just did posting. I didn't even realize that the comments could be that interesting or that they were that important. And what I noticed 
is that if I just did a post that was more of like a reporting out and I just asked a question like, what was your favorite part? Some of the comments just, it wasn't that interesting. People would say, I like this, and they'd say, I like that too, and it wasn't interesting. And that's where I tried to turn it around and make it as interactive as I can so that people have the post as a learning moment. You know, it might be that compound sentence or it might be um, the, what is a biography, but then the, to me the blog comes alive in the comment section or has the potential. So. I like it if I've built in some questions that lead to interaction between the children, lead to interaction like that biography. The kids were coming back and asking Thomas Edison questions. They were, you know, there's that interest in there's something new. There could be something new in the comment section rather than just, you know, I like this, I like that, my favorite part, my favorite part. It's more, I like to build more interactivity. Now this time of the year I'm starting to allow guest bloggers so that they we have a story to write in our class like um, you know we just had a Chumash assembly so I'm taking my photographs and I'm letting the kids write the post so why now that it, we're more than halfway through the year we're branching out for the whole class in that way but I really love the commenting section that's where it is it lives on. It's interesting. I don't know about young kids. I don't. Mine can all read and write. So maybe someone who's still in the room can comment about what would be a good way to approach it with such young children. Those are great suggestions, Linda. And is there anyone in the room who's working with kindergarten or first graders who uh, could share their experience with how this might work with the younger kids who aren't really writers yet? Although we know that many of them are beginning to write, so it may be even accepting that it's going to be the way they write. It's not going to be perfect spelled perfectly. In fact, we don't want the focus to be on the spelling and the punctuation and that sort of thing when they're first creating and, and beginning to write. Anyone want to take the mic from kindergarten? Good, Deanna. Thanks for saying that. Great, Karen. Let me give you the mic. You have the mic now. Click on talk. Okay. How are we doing? Um, doing, doing great. I think maybe what would be helpful is to go to comments for kids because I've been commenting and I've seen that there are very young kids um, blogs on there and that maybe you could connect with other teachers that way of your grade level. That's a great idea, um, Karen. Thanks for sharing that. And that is um, one of the links that um, Linda shared with us earlier. And I, I think it's with the hashtag comments for kids, for with a uh, number four. So wonderful way to connect with other teachers at your grade level. Thanks. Anyone else before we wrap up? Going once, going twice. And gone. All right. So we are going to officially stop the recording and let all of you know that the recording will be posted just as soon as everyone logs out of the room and it can be processed. So we post the recording link right away and then we'll post the full recording with embed code if any of you would like to use it anywhere. We also post the chat log um, and I will add the great links you've been sharing today into the live binder so they'll be available for every Everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us on this Saturday. You are all awesome teachers for taking the time both out of your spring breaks but out of your weekends to continue learning. So thanks everyone and hope to see you next week. <laughs>